Dan Wilcox, welcome to AHA. It's great to have you here. Well, aha, uh -huh. thank you for having me. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so you are uh, very active in the local poetry scene in Albany, and you have been for many years. Yes. You are the host of Third Thursday Night Poetry, mm -hmm. and um, you're a member of a, of a poetry group called Three Guys from Albany, yeah, well, which sounds really, really cool. <laughs> How did you first get into poetry? Oh, well, it was when I was a uh, high school, I was an adolescent. I think anybody who writes poetry starts when they're an adolescent, right? All that teenage angst and all that stuff gets written down. And if you don't start then, you start later, you're probably not much of a poet. That's the way I always look at it. So I started then, and then... Uh, so it's too late for me then. Oh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> and I, uh, I liked literature, I liked to read, and I went to college as an English major, and I kept writing poetry, and then... I was drafted into the army and I still wrote poetry and then I got out and I worked for the government and I still wrote poetry. Mm. And then uh, I really got into the poetry scene, um, like going to open mics and other readings and stuff uh, when I moved back to Albany in 87 or so. Okay. And it happened to be that that was just when things were just about ready to start. And uh, I was around and I was here. and. Uh, you know, it was a small scene, and I discovered that if you're going to be a small fish, you might as well be in a small pond. You know? Right. But now it's become a bigger scene, and then I got to be a bigger fish. I mean, not just here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, just because I've been around so long. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, so you told me the, uh, the Albany poetry scene was small back then in the 80s. Yeah. it was almost the... non-existent. Right. I mean, do you have any favorite memories, though, from it at all? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. In fact, I'm writing about it. Uh, one of my long-range projects is to write a personal history of the Albany poetry scene from when I started, up through, from that time, from 87, uh, all the way up to 2007, which is when I started writing my blog. Mm. So all the things that would end up in a book are actually now uh, on the blog from 2007. But okay. all in those intervening years, what it exists as notes in my notebooks, boxes of notebooks from going to poetry readings, and in thousands and thousands and thousands of photos I took. So over the year, I claim to have the world's largest collection of photos of unknown poets. Yeah, see, I, I found this information, I found this so interesting because, so not only are you a poet, not only are you a collaborator mm -hmm. and a writer, you're almost something of a bit of a documentarian That's or an archivist. Is. Yes, yes. Why is it important to have photographs of, of these little known or unknown poets? Well, it, actually it started out when I was still living in New York City and I would go to um, poetry readings and I wanted to remember who the poets were, because a lot of them were neighborhood people. So the first couple of readings I went to, I would take notes as to what they looked like. And I said, what, you idiot? You got a camera? Why don't you bring your camera? So I started bringing my camera, but then you got to take notes too, because you won't remember who the person is unless you write it down. So that's how I started doing it. And, back, and I'm talking, you know, I was still using a film camera back then. So this is pre-digital. And uh, now you go to poetry readings, everyone's got their phone out, right. and they're all taking pictures. Um, but at one time, I was the only one around taking pictures. Mm -hmm. I was, in the early, early days of the Writers Institute, there were even times when they didn't have a photographer there at one of the events, and somebody saw me there with my camera, and they would come to me afterwards, you have any pictures from that reading that so-and-so did? Right, yeah. And I did. So they have them in their archives, too. Right. Well, in terms of, of sharing and giving, I mean, I, I know that there's a strong relationship between poetry and social justice, right? Well, uh, and social yeah. justice is something that people have been talking a lot about, especially recently mm -hmm. in the news and yeah. through blogs and online media. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about what do you think is the relationship between poetry and social justice? Well, and, and if, you know, if you don't mind in answering that, <laughs> what is social justice to you? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I don't want to limit it just to poetry. I mean, you know, as an art historian, art is very political too, mm -hmm. or can be. Um, and there, there are people who study posters, right? The protest posters or Soviet art of the mm -hmm. early 20th century, all that kind of stuff. Well, so even the aesthetics of painting itself can be political yes, too. Yes, yeah. Absolutely. And look at some, well, look at. Frida Kahlo and people like that. Yeah. So uh, I think that's part of the energy of art 
is to express your concerns about what's going on in the world. And now we have this term social justice, which I kind of like because it's, it, it's very broad. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just limited to things like the peace movement or the environmental movement, but it has to do you know, with gender issues, uh, animal rights issues, all that. Anything that you can lump into that category. But, and, and when people are concerned about something, they express themselves. So if you're in love, you express yourself, you express your love and everything. But uh, with political stuff, you, uh, it's the same thing. It's really, it's, it's actually the same impulse as writing a love poem to writing a political poem. So I'm actually curious to know, I know you're, you're including the arts on a larger level in mm -hmm. terms of uh, playing a role in social justice, mm -hmm. but do you think that poetry plays any particular kind of role in helping achieve social justice goals? Well, it can be because it's much more direct. You can talk about these issues. You can explain them. Mm -hmm. You don't. Uh, a lot. Sometimes political poetry can be very heavy-handed, mm -hmm. but it also can be very direct and meaningful to people that they get it. I have a poem called Baghdad Albany that I imagine the uh, invasion of, of Baghdad back in 2003 as if it was happening in Albany, mm -hmm. and uh, it was published in a broadside by the friends of the library back way back then, and. I was at a peace demonstration one time, and they asked me to read the poem. I read it, and afterwards, a woman came up to me, who I'd never met before, and she says, I have that in my refrigerator. That's fantastic. So, so it was this kind of statement that to people who don't normally read poetry, but they could understand it. And, and they could hear it outside, right? Mm -hmm. It's something, it's spoken word. It's something spoken that word, can be yep, shared yep. verbally. You can, or you can read it on people. a piece of paper, too, if you want to. Right, right, you know? right. So it, it has a more direct effect on people. So why don't you tell me a little bit about maybe some of the poems that you've written before in the past that you think are the best poems and why? <laughs> Even yeah. though I know yeah, that you're yeah. limited in terms of you can't yeah. read a poem at this yeah. point, but okay. maybe tell me a little bit about like what, well, how you would measure your own uh, best poem. There is one, one of the ones that pops into my mind uh, is a non-political poem I wrote called Teresa's Balcony. And it came about as I was walking to work in Albany, and I went down this side street, Spring Street in Albany, and looking in the backs of the building, and someone I knew came out on the fire escape of her building to hang a towel over the railing or something. And earlier, a few days before, a friend of mine came back from Paris with a collection of photos by Eugene Auger. You know the photographer? Yes, I do. Yeah. So I noticed in there, back then, very slow shutter speeds and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you know, or the, you'd leave the, the lens open. Right. And if somebody moved, then there was like a wisp of smoke right. on there. Right, and Ajay uh, usually focused on like roads and boulevards roads and architecture and there, But there were sometimes people in there, and sometimes right. all it was is a blur. Right. And so I worked those two things together in the poem. And the reason I, I like it is uh, it takes reality another step, you know? It's, it's based on a real thing, but it's also based on a real historical thing. It mixes them up, and it just creates something brand new that didn't happen before. Yeah, it you sounds know? like it's like almost adds a certain element of like your perception, your experience of something yeah. that actually happened, which can yeah. be different from one person to the next, right? right? Or like a, or even a dream thing, you know. You know, from visual arts, some of the most fascinating things are things that don't look real. You know, Salvador Dali. Everyone Absolutely. likes Salvador Dali because they're they're fantastic, and they're and they're. Right. Uh, I mentioned Frida Kahlo before. Another person. Yeah. You know, she painted these things that were based on herself, but they weren't herself. Right. You know? Right. They had a certain root in reality, yeah. but they also could express themselves or sort of come to fruition through some fast, fantastical and subjective elements yeah. too. And that seems to be like what that's the beauty of poetry. Yeah. Well, right? and, and, and like I say, all art, and that's why ordinary quote unquote, ordinary people, you know, can appreciate these paintings, can appreciate poetry. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, Dan, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on AHA, and uh, <laughs> I hope to read even more of your poetry well, thank in the you very future. much. I was very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.